Rishan and his family were moving from the big city to a small house on a mountainside in India. Rishan had many toys, and his mom and dad needed to talk with him about getting rid of some of them. You don't need all these big toys, his dad said. You are going to be very busy doing things other than playing with them. His mom talked about the children living in the village near the new house. The village children are poor and don't have nice toys like you, she said. Why don't you give them your big toys? Rashan was an obedient boy, and he didn't mind giving away his big toys. He gave them to the boys and girls in the village, who were very excited to receive the gifts. They had never owned such nice toys before. Rishan was happy to see their joy, and it felt so good to do something kind for others. As the days passed, Rishan saw that his mom and dad were right. He was very busy. He went to school at home, with his mom teaching him English, Hindi, and other languages, and his dad teaching him math and science. When Rishan wasn't studying, he worked in the family garden, planting, weeding, and harvesting corn, potatoes, and other crops. Every day he memorized three verses from the Bible. After a few months, he could recite many chapters by memory, including Psalm 23 and Hebrews 11. Rishan didn't have much time to play, even with his small toys, so he also gave them away to the village children. The children, especially the little ones, quickly became Rishan's friends. At first, they liked him because he gave them toys, but then they got to know him and they saw that he was a kind, gentle boy. They liked to visit Rishan at his house on the mountainside. Rishan liked to play with the children. Sometimes they played with Rishan's old toys, but most of the time they played church. You see, the children weren't Christians and their parents weren't Christians. They didn't know anything about God creating the world or Jesus dying for people's sins. They didn't know anything about praying to God. But by playing church, Rishan taught the children about Jesus. They sat on the dusty ground as Rashan told them stories about Adam and Eve, Noah's Ark, David and Goliath, and Daniel in the lion's den. He told them about Jesus dying on the cross to give eternal life to everyone who believes in him. He invited them to pray to Jesus and showed them how. Dear God, he said, thank you for being our very best friend. Please give us a heart of love for you and for others. In Jesus' name, amen. The other children began to copy Rashan's prayers, and they told their parents about the Bible stories. Then some of the parents even asked Rashan's parents to know more about Jesus. Now Rashan doesn't have much time to play with his remaining toys. He is too busy being a missionary for Jesus.
Good morning, church family. Welcome. We're so glad that you're here with us today. It's a, it's a beautiful day, isn't it? The sun may not be brightly shining on this side of the clouds, but every day with Jesus is a beautiful day. We are so glad that you're here with us. If you're worshiping with us online, we're, we're glad to have you join us. And um, we just welcome you as we all come before the Lord for one purpose, to worship him, um, glorify his name, and, and um, go away from here better people than we are, were when we first got here this morning. So join us as we um, worship in praise. Good morning, everyone. Can you all see me? It's nice to see all of you. I can see you. Good. I don't know um, if you've noticed, um, but I've been seeing in our world that more and more there are people struggling with depression and anxiety. Um, fight or flight, have you heard that, that term? That's, that's where our world is at, fight or flight. Um, even among people that generally don't uh, experience fear, even among followers of Jesus. And so as I was preparing um, for today and praying, I felt impressed that I should share a small testimony with you. For most of my life, um, I've had to cope with depression and anxiety um, on a daily basis. Um, if you had come to my house, over our fireplace hangs this really big picture of a beautiful white horse. And um, there's a verse on it, and it's 2 Timothy 1.7. It says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Drew gave that to me after God freed me from a particularly debilitating time in my life. And um, it serves as a reminder that I am a child of the king of the universe. And I have nothing to fear as long as I um, stay connected to him. And um, by my desk, I've handwritten verses from the Bible, and I've taped them up. It looks really trashy, but it's, it serves its purpose well, because when I look up from my computer, I can see them. Um, so be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid, and do not panic, for the Lord your God will personally go before you. He will never fail you or abandon you. Deuteronomy 31.6. Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand, Isaiah 41.10. Did you know that there are enough verses in this love letter from God that every day of the year we can re be reminded that we don't have to be afraid? So... Um, during this time, uh, while you're here, my prayer is that through the music, through the scripture that is read, through the words that are spoken from that pulpit, that you will be bathed in God's love and that you will be reminded that you are a child of the one true God who is more powerful than anything we could ever face in this life. Our first song is, He is Able. He's able, he's able, I know he's able, I know my Lord is able to carry me through. He's able, he's able, I know he's able, I know my Lord is able to carry me through. Free. He made the lame to walk again and 
eyes the blind to see. He's able, he's able, I know. You don't want to do that again, do you? Okay, she's not moving the, the thing. So my thought, people are laughing already just because I'm talking. My thought this week about fear is about heaven. Is there any fear in heaven? No. Think about that. Heaven is a calm place all the time. There's no fear in heaven. There's no anxiety. There's no angel hovering in the corner with a harp worried about the next moment or what's going to happen. There is no fear in heaven. And we can have a little bit of heaven here on earth. We can have a whole lot of heaven here on earth. If we believe and we worship God and we ask for the Holy Spirit to come into our lives. When that happens, do you think that we'll be calm? That we'll have anything to fear down here on this planet? Just something to think about. I, I appreciate your honesty. I agree. I don't think that we will have anything to fear. And, and believe me, I do fear things, okay? I'm not up here saying I'm a perfect Christian. I have anxiety. I have fears, things that I fear as well here on this planet. But we can, when we contemplate the way God runs heaven, there is no fear, there's no anxiety there, and that can be ours. Here's a couple other verses. 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels principalities, nor things present, things to come, powers, height, depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We can have calm in our lives. We can have no fear in our lives if we have Jesus in our lives. Jesus, I can safely go anywhere he leads me in this world below anywhere without him dearest joys would fade anywhere with Jesus I am not afraid anywhere anywhere fear I cannot know Jesus, I can safely go. Anywhere with Jesus, I am not alone. Other friends may fail me, he is still my own. Though his hand may lead me over dreary ways, anywhere with Jesus is a house of praise. I can safely go anywhere with Jesus I can go to sleep when the gloomy shadows round about me creep knowing I shall wake and never more to roam anywhere with Jesus will be home sweet home That includes Walmart, right? This next song might be familiar to some of you, but 
If you were born after the 80s, it may be a new song for you. So wait, I have to tell everybody, tomorrow is Lisa's birthday. Thank you. And I will say it, she's going to be 50, <laughs> which makes me feel really old, too. <laughs> Yeah, so here we go. This is an awesome song. When she brought it up, it's true. I haven't heard this since the 80s or the early 90s. So if you are willing to sing, it is your choice. I would invite you to sing with us. There is no problem to be. God cannot solve it. it. There is no mountain too tall. He cannot move it. There is no storm too dark. God cannot calm it. There is no sorrow too deep. Soothe it. If he carried the weight of the world upon his shoulders, I know, my brother, that he will carry you. If he carried the weight of the world upon his shoulders, you guys have a blessed Sabbath and a fearless week this next week. And happy Thanksgiving. The world is in crisis. The number of people forcibly displaced by war, conflict, or persecution recently reached a record high of 60 million. That includes over 15 million refugees. All over the world, people are migrating in search of a better life for themselves and for their children. The result is huge population shifts. As of last year, 14% of America's population was foreign-born. It's estimated that over 42% of Sydney, Australia's population is foreign-born. Our demographic landscape is changing dramatically, and we can easily allow the multitude of cultural voices, from political parties to media outlets, drive the way we feel about the world moving from all nations to all nations. As believers, though, the only outside voice we should care about is God's. So what does the Bible say about God's heart for the foreigner? Depending on your Bible translation, you'll see the words aliens, sojourners, foreigners, and strangers over 100 times in Scripture. In Deuteronomy alone, God commands His people to love the foreigner, use tithes to bless the foreigners, assemble with foreigners to listen to God's word, invite foreigners to holidays and feasts, and to take care of the physical needs of foreigners. Why would God issue such commands? 
Again, Deuteronomy makes it clear, because the Israelites were once foreigners in Egypt, because the Israelites were slaves and God redeemed them, and ultimately so that others could learn to fear the Lord and follow God. God's instructions on this matter go far beyond Deuteronomy though. Think about the story of Ruth. Ruth was a foreigner from Moab who married a Jewish man who died, leaving her a widow. Culturally, Ruth should have returned to her native land to be reunited with her own family and her own people. Indeed, Naomi, her mother-in-law, encourages her to do just that. But Ruth won't leave. She had been shown so much love and kindness by Naomi that she proclaimed, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Ruth decided to forsake the beliefs of her own people in order to follow the one true God of Israel. Imagine what could happen if Christians all over the world welcomed, loved, and showed hospitality to the refugees, immigrants, and international students flooding into our countries. We could have a great harvest of people saying, I want your people to be my people, and your God to be my God. God's concern for the foreigner continues into the New Testament. Which commandments did Jesus proclaim as the greatest? Yep, love God and love your neighbor. He goes on to explain that your neighbor is not the person you expect, but the Samaritan, the foreigner, the one not like you, the one you would normally avoid. Jesus didn't just teach God's love for the foreigner, he demonstrated it by healing Gentile demoniacs, engaging in a spiritual debate with a Samaritan woman at a well, praising the faith of a Roman centurion, and celebrating the Gentile widow from Zarephath who fed Elijah. These were all foreigners, outcasts, strangers. In Acts chapter 2, who were the first people to hear the wonders of God in their own languages at Pentecost? It was the foreigners dwelling in Jerusalem. That's right, the first people to respond to the gospel when the Holy Spirit showed up were the nations living among the Jews. Paul makes God's intentions clear in his sermon at the Areopagus, where he proclaims, God made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. What if we took that message to heart? What if the movement of peoples all over the world is not something to fear? What if the influx of immigrants, refugees, and international students is in fact a blessing, an opportunity orchestrated by God in order to fulfill the Great Commission? Historically, missions has been focused on leaving your context and going out to reach the nations, and that must continue. But perhaps welcoming is just as strategic in the mission for God to be glorified among every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. And remember, according to Ephesians 2, we were all strangers and foreigners, even enemies to the kingdom, before Jesus made a way for us to be citizens, children, and heirs. Pray, give, go, welcome. Where is God calling you? Just in watching that, um, I want God's word to be what is the governing body of what I choose to do. Um, I think it can so quickly become a political thing, and it is not. I mean, God's word calls us to love the foreigners, to love the refugees, and we have a huge opportunity here in the Kansas City area. Um, there are many refugees, and we have a contact, which is so great, because Anna is so involved, and so many in our church, other families that are involved with her, and that hands-on are there working with these kids and these families, and they have a need, and so we get to help provide for that need. It's the hats and gloves and scarves and socks. Those are asking to be new, and then gently used coats. Uh, for kids and teens is what we're asking for. And Elizabeth also let me know that they could really use the kid-sized masks. So that's another need that they have. So I just invite you guys next week is our last week that we'll be collecting those. If for some reason you're going to be gone, like we're going to be gone for Thanksgiving, uh, just you can call. My number is in the bulletin and arrange for us to meet you or sometime to be here to get the things that you want to donate so that we can help these families. Like Elizabeth had told me, and I, some of you were here last week, but there are some families that are new from the Congo that this will be their first winter in a really cold place, so we'd like to help them out. And just a reminder, then the king will say to those on his right,
come you who are blessed by my Father, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink, or a stranger and show you hospitality? And the king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Thank you. Our children's story is going to be told by Lottie today. Good morning, boys and girls. Happy Sabbath. I'm going to talk about something today that you may or may not know anything about, but I'm going to show you, uh, show you what I'm going to talk about. And my rope just came off my anchor. So, you just never know what you're going to find in a lady's purse. Now then, this is called an anchor. I don't know if you little ones know what an anchor is. I'm going to tell you. When a boat, a canoe, a vacationing yacht needs to stop somewhere, a boat has to be kept in one place. And they throw an anchor out into the water. And that anchor drags along and it stabilizes it makes that boat stay in one place and you know we each of us have our own anchor did you know that an anchor that'll keep us in one place and safe and he has a name his name is Jesus and he is my anchor <laughs> and I'm so thankful that he keeps me straight now then the nice thing about having an anchor is an anchor can be any size you want it to be. Did you know that there are anchors as big as this part of the church? They're massive. I looked it up on the internet, and we know the internet's always right. <laughs> but they had a picture of it, and they had another one, and this lady was standing next to it, and she was about this big, and the anchor was about that big. That is not an exaggeration. Do you know that my anchor, Jesus, is bigger than any physical anchor on the earth? And I cling to him. And little boys and girls, he loves you and he wants to be your anchor and help you stay strong and courageous and always next to him. God bless you and everybody have a happy Sabbath afternoon. Thank you, Lottie. I, I love her description of an anchor. Sometimes I feel like an anchor I have on, an, on the flip side of that is my memory. And that can be a negative anchor. Um, you ever forget something you're supposed to do? So earlier when I welcomed you to church, I was supposed to tell you also to remember that when we leave church, let's not all all of us just hang out in the foyer. Um, let's give each other space. It's, it's still a beautiful day outside, so we can enjoy visiting a little bit outside as well. So um, remember to, to continue what we're, we're suggested to do in the rest of our lives is kind of have that distance and, and just um, look out for each other and our health. Um, Today's offering is for our local church budget. And one of the things that, there are many things that I think of when I think of a local church budget. Um, the ministries that are provided here are much more than I could do on my own um, if I just decided to be a self-contained ministry and go out and spread the gospel. I would be very limited because I'm one person. 
as we come together and, and share in our resources, we can do much more. Um, one of the things that has impacted my life at Chapel Oaks and the ministries here, I could talk about the children's ministries, I could talk about Pathfinders, but one very recent was last year, um, a little bit over a year ago, we, my wife and I um, took part in a ministry here that um, many of you, I'm sure all of you know about. It's um, Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University. And um, sometimes, you know, we're in our humanity, things take a little bit to stick. And we really decided to, okay, you know, God is really calling us to um, take care of the resources that he has given us. And we've taken it seriously. And not knowing, you know, what the future holds, because none of us do, um, it has changed our lives radically. And um, some of the things that we, <coughs> excuse me, were struggling with in the um, past years, we had a little more margin in our lives this year and um, financial margin, um, just that peace that that gives you. And it's provided opportunities for us to not only be at peace a little bit more in our own lives, but to be able to do things for others that, that, we, that needed to be done at, at times as they come up. And so that's just a little taste of what ministries at Chapel Oaks does for our communities and for our church. And as the Lord speaks to your hearts, I just encourage you to give as he um, invites you to give and not look at what he's done for you in the past only, but look at what he's going to do for you in the future. None of us know what the future holds but we do know that the future is in God's hands. Our um, scripture today is found in John 17, 17 through 23, and I would just like to read that for you today. It says, um, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. For their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those who also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe you sent me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me, and love them, even as you have loved me. Through our giving, through our testimony of what God has done, we show the world who God is and um, through our unity. So I invite you to give. There's many ways to give. There's a um, box in the back that if you are here, you can put your offerings in that box and it will be collected after the service. Um, if you're watching online or, or if it's just more convenient for you, you can certainly go online and, and give that way. Um, you can drop your offering off during the week at the church. Um, whatever works best for you, um, we want to provide those opportunities. For those who are able, um, I invite you to join me as I kneel for prayer. Father in heaven, as we um, come before you today, we're just so grateful, Lord, that... Um, for one, for your love. It is so um, beyond our comprehension how you sent your son to this earth 
not merely to provide a sacrifice to um, redeem us, but you sent him so that we could see who you are, that you are love, that you desire us to have that same love in our lives, in our community, to share it not only among ourselves, but with a world that needs you. Lord, as we come before you this morning, many of us come with heavy hearts. We live in a world that is full of suffering. There is sickness even in our midst. There are people that have um, experienced COVID firsthand in their homes. There are other sicknesses that um, we are dealing with, surgeries. Lord, I, I pray for those people that are personally dealing with that right now. Lord, I pray for those that are struggling in their finances, that are struggling in their relationship with you. Um, I pray that you will place your hand of mercy upon each one, that your spirit will come down and um, comfort and surround them with your love that, that we as a community will be your hands and feet in their midst and in their time of need. Lord, as we listen to the sermon that Pastor Mike has prepared today, that your spirit um, is desiring to speak through him, I pray that you will touch his lips, that the words that you speak through him today will fall upon fertile ground, that as each one of us listen that we will um, take to heart what we hear, that you will bring the unity that you desire in your church into our midst, and that we will be the, the light in our community that you desire us to be. Thank you, Lord, for hearing and answering our prayers. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
the theme of the stories I've heard for so long. God has been faithful. He will be again. His loving compassion, it knows. Amen. Thank you, Lisa. Let's just uh, praise the Lord for that right now. Lord, we praise you that your mercies are new every morning. They truly are. Your faithfulness endures to every generation. And every need that we have had, you have supplied. How can we thank you enough? We praise you. I'm thinking about our mission statement right now. And I hope this little memory device will help you. I find it very helpful because I want to remember this mission statement. Number one, because it's biblically based. It comes from the Bible. The principles of this mission statement come right from the Bible. That's why I appreciate it. It comes from one of my favorite passages of Scripture, John 17. But the little memory tool that I hope to pass on to you to help you remember the significance of this mission statement just has to do with your hands. Our mission statement is to know Jesus, be one in him, and make him known. It's not very long, is it? But I believe it's profound. And so the little tool is, as I shared last week, I hope to drill this into you, to know Jesus, to know him intimately. Prayer is a good place to begin with knowing Jesus intimately, you know it? To know Jesus and to be one in him. You know, there's something about getting to know Jesus as you press in to know Jesus, as you respond to his spirit's call to you saying, come, come to me, come into my presence, you're going to find other people that are pressing into his presence. And so I'd like, to think, I'd like you to think of your, of your hands now, reaching out a hand to join hands with others who are pressing in to know Jesus, right? Reaching out to get close to others, to join hands then with those others that are pressing in his presence and think of reaching out your other hand with your brother or sister who are reaching out their other hand to a world that doesn't know Jesus yet. To know Jesus, be one in him, and make him known. That is our mission. Are you with me on the mission, brothers and sisters? I hope so, because we're going to study that mission again today, right from the Bible, to know Jesus, be one in him, and make him known. I'm going to begin with a story this morning. Does anyone recognize a celebrity in this picture? Now let me throw you for your... There is, there is one in here, actually. But let me throw you for a spin. You realize any picture of a human being I put up there is a celebrity in God's eyes? <laughs> That's true. Everyone is important to God, aren't they? But, but publicly, or in our world, in the media, there actually is a celebrity in that picture. It's the lady right in the middle. Now, I'm going to drop another picture on you, and let's see if this sparks anyone's memory. Unfortunately, this dates me a little bit. You know, when I say 19, and, and I'll give you a hint, the year is 1987 when this woman was a celebrity. And she's 30-some years old here, so this is a more, much more recent picture. Does anyone recognize that woman in the previous picture is this little girl right here. Does anyone recognize that little girl? Because that picture was taken sometime again after the event, but she was in the media 
a very prominent place, actually with the president, when this photo was taken. Does anyone recognize her yet? Okay. Well, the event that made this little girl so famous was a tragic event in 1987. She fell into an eight-inch well. Okay, this is Jessica McClure. In, this, uh, in the previous picture, it would have been Morales. It is Morales today. She's married. She was born March 26, eight, uh, I'm sorry, 1986, and widely was known as on the media as Baby Jessica does that ring a bell now? Okay, that was some time ago, wasn't it? So yes, she fell into the well in her aunt's backyard in Midland, Texas, October 14, 1987. She was only 18 months of age. Remember that? That was all over the news at the time, yeah. So the, for the next six, 56 hours, rescuers worked frantically to successfully free this little girl from the eight-inch well casing. She was approximately 22 feet below the surface of the ground. Firemen and police teamed together to form a plan to drill a parallel shaft to the well where little Jessica was lodged, in a very uncomfortable position, I might add. And then the plan was to drill a horizontal cross tunnel between the two shafts, so they enlisted the help of some local oil drillers. Officials hoped to free Jessica quickly before they discovered that this well was surrounded by solid rock. The rescuers' jackhammers were inadequate as they were designed for downward drilling rather than horizontal. So a mining engineer eventually arrived to help supervise and coordinate this rescue effort. And he used a relatively new technology at the time called water jet cutting. And this is what was eventually used to cut through that rock and reach little Jessica. 45 hours after Jessica fell into the well, the adjacent shaft and cross tunnel were complete. But that wasn't the end of the story. During the drilling, rescuers could hear Jessica singing a little song. Winnie the Pooh, Winnie the Pooh. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Comforted her somehow. A paramedic, Robert O'Donnell was ultimately able to inch his way very slowly through that tunnel and wrestle Jessica free from her position, pinned inside that little eight-inch well casing with one leg above her forehead. Can you imagine spending that many hours in that position? Finally, he handed her to another paramedic who carried her up to safety before giving her to another paramedic who carried her to a waiting ambulance. In the midst of a bleak news cycle that included conflict in the Middle East at the time, severe conflict in the Middle East, the First Lady Nancy Reagan's struggle with breast cancer at the time, and e uh, there were indicators of economic problems looming, this image of Jessica arriving alive from her ordeal in the arms of one of her rescuers, briefly but powerfully united our nation. It did, at least for a short time. Now, in our study of John 17 recently, it occurs to me that though it is true that unity among God's people is one of the greatest testimonies to the world that Jesus is real, that Jesus' power to save is real, and that he's alive today, and he's an a, a effective, powerful Savior. It is also true that unity comes as a result of God's people praying for and working for the salvation of the lost. You see, there are many things in the economy of the gospel that I believe can be compared, numerous, numerous things in the gospel, can be compared to the sign for infinity. You know, the figure eight sign, infinity. So it goes like this. When it comes to unity, unity causes the world to say, there must be something to this Jesus. The gospel must be real. But also as God's people work for the salvation of lost people, they find themselves coming into closer and closer unity. It's 
infinity that this happens like this, you see. Now, CNN covered Jessica's rescue effort with the then President Ronald Reagan, and Reagan is quoted as saying, everybody in America became godmothers and godfathers of Jessica while this was going on. I like that. And I see another lesson for us today. Reagan's words deserve our consideration right here. Everybody in America, everybody in America became godmothers and godfathers of Jessica while this was going on. Church, is that not sort of what God has in mind for you and me? It's church. Aren't there a lot of Jessicas stuck today? And in a sense, he's calling us to be the godmothers and godfathers and the rescue participants, as it were, in his rescue mission for those that are stuck. Jesus prayed in John 17, verse 18, to his father, as you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. Who was he talking about? Well, first layer is his own disciples. But the passage in John 17 also says he was praying not only for them, but for those also who would believe in him, right? So, friend, you and I were included in that prayer. As the Father sent Jesus into the world, he's sending you and me into this world. And Christ's desire, Christ's earnest desire and it's the Father's desire too, but Christ voices it in this prayer so beautifully, is that we accomplish the same thing that he was sent to accomplish. Pause and think about that. Pause and think about that. That's a tall order, isn't it? Humanly, it's an impossible order. But the things that are impossible with men are what? Possible with God, that's right. So what was Jesus sent to accomplish? Let's let him answer. Let's let him answer. And in the very next chapter, we find an answer very close by this one. In John 18, verse 37, he's before Pilate. Pilate is questioning him or trying to question him. And Jesus later doesn't have a lot to say, but he answers the first question. Pilate says, are you a king? Jesus answered, you rightly say that I'm a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I've come into the world. Here's his answer. Jesus, why did you come into the world? He tells Pilate that I should bear witness to the truth. Jesus came to bear witness to the truth, right? That's probably not a surprise to most of you, but ponder this with me. This world is filled with darkness, and that darkness is the misunderstanding and misapprehension of the true character of God. That's the darkness of this world. And while it is true that our mission is not simply to spread information or correct errors, and I would be unbiblical if I said to you that Jesus didn't do both of those things. He did. He taught the truth from the scriptures, and he also exposed errors. On one occasion, it's rather shocking the, when, I, when I read it, to the religious leaders of his day, he said to their face, you do greatly err not knowing the scriptures or the power of God. Now, I would like to hear the tone of his voice when he said that. And please understand, Jesus didn't go around just correcting people's errors all the time. I think we need to keep that in mind as well. But it would be unbiblical to say he never did that. He did do that very directly. You see, Satan had spread so many lies about God, it became vital for those dark lies to be dispelled. And while it is true that our mission is not simply to explain Bible doctrines, it is absolutely essential that Bible truth be proclaimed Otherwise, people can't see what God is really like. You see, there's sometimes in our minds, because of our sin, there's friction 
between these things, not in the mind of God. To proclaim the truth is not simply to exposit abstract doctrines, it's to proclaim God himself. Now Satan, again, has spread these lies, and it, is, it was Christ's mission, and it is our mission to dispel those lies and proclaim the truth about our Heavenly Father. Amen? Amen? So no wonder Jesus was frequently heard expressing this sentiment or these very words. It is written. He spoke of the scriptures as having absolute authority because they do. And when it comes to what God is like, that's the only place to find the secure, definite, and unquestionable answer. That's why he would preach that way. It is written. Now, the better you and I know what is written in the scriptures, the more effective we will be at communicating what God is really like. That's what it means to bear witness to the truth. We're not just bearing witness to this is a fact. We're bearing witness to the fact that this is what God is really like. Have you seen the beauty of God as you study his word? That's what we're looking for when we study the Bible. The beauty of God. The truth about God. Now, Jesus had more to say, though, about his mission. Look at Luke 19, verse 10. <clears throat> the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's exactly what believers are called to do as well, my friends. We can't simply wait for the lost to come to us. Jesus said, go into all the world. Just as he came to seek, we are called to seek those that are lost. And just as Jessica was stuck in that well, so, the, so sin itself and the misunderstanding about the character of God gets people stuck. Stuck in a way that they often will not seek God in a church or in a church event. Not at all. We must go after them. We must seek them out to show them as well as tell them what God is really like. And it is true that we have no power to save anyone. We don't. Only Jesus can do that. But he has promised his presence through the Spirit to equip us to do the same work that he did so that we can bring people to the Savior. Amen? In Matthew 20, Jesus expresses why he was sent to this world in other words. Matthew 20, verse 28. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a what? A ransom for many. As you sent me into the world, even so I sent them into the world, Father. Wait a minute. Jesus paid the ransom, right? And only Jesus can pay the ransom. He satisfied the demands of divine justice, the justice of God's law in behalf of the whole world. And that happened once. That happened once. And no one else could accomplish it. Only the Son of God could accomplish that. That's done, right? It is done. Yes. But notice the context of the verse. Jesus is making an application to believers in this passage. It's quite fascinating. Verse 27 and 28. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. Now, while it's true, I can't pay the ransom price, nor can you for any person to be saved. You and I can make a decision whether or not we will give ourselves to complete unselfish service to humanity. We do have that privilege of making a decision or not. So let's look at one more reason Jesus says he was sent. Luke 4, 18 and 19. He's quoting an Old Testament passage, and he's applying it directly to himself. But he says, this is why he came. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. You see, Jesus did not only teach. He healed and restored people's lives. In fact, more than one commentator has noticed he spent more time healing and restoring than he did teaching. And his healings and restorations were just fortifying the lessons that he taught with his mouth, right? Now, 
as our example, he's our example in this area too. The sick, the widows, the orphans, the prisoner, the hungry, the homeless, the oppressed. And there's more, right? All the needs of humanity, physical, mental, social, spiritual, are to be addressed by the church because this is what Jesus came to do. But as a local church, we cannot possibly meet every need effectively of our community, can we? But we can do something, and I believe we can do more than we're currently doing. Do you believe that? Amen. And we should be asking the Lord to show us what more there is to do. So why would we want to be personally involved in witnessing? Luke chapter 15 gives three beautiful stories of things, objects, and a person who were lost, but then were found. We have the story of a sheep that is lost and is found. We have the story of a coin, a very valuable coin. And my understanding of the culture at that time, the reason this, you know, you think of one coin being lost, that doesn't seem that significant. But I've heard someone share the story that in that culture, this coin would be like a, a, um, um, a protective fund that in the horrible event of loss of a husband or a divorce, that these coins, and there were maybe several uh, sometimes sewn in the garments of a woman in that era, um, the loss of that would be very, very tragic. But this coin is lost, and it's found again. And then the story of the prodigal. The son is lost, but then he returns home. So what's the point of every story? Notice what Jesus said. The punchline in each one, John 15, 6, Rejoice with me! I found my sheep which was lost. Luke 15, 9, rejoice with me. I found the peace, that is the coin that was lost. Luke 15, 23 and 24, bring the fatted calf here and kill it. Let us eat and be merry for this. My son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to make merry. How does Jesus apply all of these lessons in summary? It's found in verse 10. So likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Joy? Where is the joy? The joy is in the presence of the angels. I don't know about you, but that seems to indicate to me they're watching the joy on the Father's face. I believe they're rejoicing too, don't you? But it's in the presence of the angels that this joy is. The Old Testament says he rejoices over his people with singing. I believe it's the Father that's rejoicing. They're simply joining in. And of course, it makes the Lord Jesus happy as well, doesn't it? When sinners repent and come to their senses and come back to their Father. Well, that ought to be enough alone to say, I'm going to participate in this because it makes God happy. That really ought to be enough, had not it? But there actually are more than more reasons than that, that we would want to be involved in this. Matthew 28, 19, and 20, the Great Commission, I'm sure you're familiar with. Go make disciples of all nations. Preach the gospel to every creature. You're familiar with this passage. And he says, I'm with you always in this work. Friends, the second reason I would urge each of us to consider being involved in the Lord's mission is really not complicated. He said, do this, please. This is my command. And I assure you, any time Jesus says to do something, it's not only the right thing to do, there's a great blessing for you and me if we simply do what he says. Do you remember those 10 lepers that were beside the road crying out for Jesus? They had heard somehow the news that he had healed not only other sick people, but unbelievably, he had healed a leper. And news had reached them, and so they cry out to Jesus. They cry out to him. They lifted up their voice and they said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And in verse 14 of Luke 17, the Bible says, when, they, when he saw them, he said to them, go show yourself to the priests. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. Oh, there's a lesson for us in that. Listen, don't wait until you think you have your life all together. Don't wait until you think you know the Bible better than you do. Don't wait until you feel ready to minister to others in behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just go and do what you can now. And friends, you know what happened to those lepers. As they went, they were healed. 
That's why it's so urgent that whether we feel like we've changed or not or whether we feel we've got it all together or not, that's why it is vital for us to just go and do it anyway because as we go, everything that we lack, everything that we need will be provided. It will come. That's quite an experience the Lord wants us to have. You know, Jesus' teachings focus on this principle of giving when you feel like you can't even do it anyway luke 6 38 give and it will be given to you he says proverbs eleven twenty five 25 says the generous soul will be made rich and he who waters will also be watered himself this is the economy of god not just in financial material things friends This is true of spiritual things too. Are you longing for a deeper experience with Christ? Are you longing to have powerful answers to prayer? Are you longing to see his providential hand moving in in your territory, in your life, and in the lives of those that you pray for? Then simply do what he's asked you to do. If we do like the lepers did, do exactly what Jesus says, the same response of healing and restoration takes place in our lives as took place in the lepers. The more you share the gospel, the more gospel you will have to share. Steps of Christ, page 80, says, the only way, hey, the word only is pretty powerful, isn't it? It's very important. What does it mean? The only way, that's right. I mean, you can't simplify it anymore. It means only. If if you're looking for a result, there's only one way you're going to find the result, right? Right? There's a science in this statement. The only way to grow in grace is to be disinterestedly, that means unselfishly, doing the very work which Christ has enjoined upon us. Take care of the needs of others. Share the gospel. Minister in my name. Do the things that I did when I walked this earth. Amen? So again, don't wait for something to change before you go. Believe that God has called you and begin to act. That's when the blessings happen. Now there's another reason that makes witnessing, sharing the gospel, sharing the light, sharing the truth about God. I mean, there's many ways you could uh, word this. There's one more reason that makes this almost automatic. Now, I say almost automatic because everyone has a choice in this matter. But this last principle makes this almost automatic. When I fell in love with Cheryl, and I still am, I didn't find it difficult to talk about her. I didn't find it difficult to talk about her at all because she was on my mind all the time. Now, some people may have been a little tired of me talking about Cheryl (laughs) because I really talked about her a lot. But I couldn't help myself. Love caused that to happen. Love made it happen. And the same we will find in our relationship with Jesus When we love Jesus, we can't help ourselves but talk about him, share him, show him, and follow him. Amen? Amen. Peter and John were arrested for speaking in the name of Jesus, for ministering in the name of Jesus. They were arrested. Stop this, they were told by the authorities. No more of this. They commanded them. Stop it. And they thought they could stop it, but you can't stop the power of love. Don't you just love their answer? Acts chapter 4, verse 20. We cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Friends, when the love of Jesus, when love for Jesus is in our hearts, and when the love of Jesus is abiding in our hearts, we can't help ourselves. It's going to happen. We'll be talking about Jesus. We'll be walking with Jesus, we'll be working with Jesus for others, we'll be focused on Jesus when his love abides in our hearts. You'll find that love for Christ will lead you and me to the very same experience that those apostles had. I love this quote from the Great Controversy, page 70. You talk about fundamentals of Christian experience. Here's one of them. The Spirit of Christ is a missionary spirit. The very first impulse of the renewed heart is to bring others also to the Savior. You ever wrestle with the question? Oh, I've done it. I think it's normal, and we should ask the question, have I been converted? 
am I converted? I was raised with the doctrines, I know that. I can articulate the facts about the gospel, what Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, even his priestly ministry means, yeah. But am I converted? That's the real question. That's the real question. Well, here's a hint that will help us understand if we are. <clears throat> the very first impulse of a renewed heart, that's a converted heart, <clears throat> is to bring others also to the Savior. I think of an old hymn, Redeemed. Don't you love the phrase in the, in the hymn, Redeemed? I sing for I cannot keep silent. His love is the theme of my song. Right? That's what this is about. Next week is Thanksgiving. Unfortunately, COVID is going to interrupt that for a lot of people. There may be no gatherings for some. There may be very limited gatherings for others. But for the sake of illustration, will you just imagine a story with me right now? That COVID is non-existent. It's over. No more regulations. No more suggestions even about what you should or shouldn't do in terms of gatherings. No doubt you'd be meeting with someone, right? Yes. Gather some family members maybe you haven't seen in a long time. Well, imagine with me right now a family with three children. They're adult children now. It's Thanksgiving Day. The children are all grown up. Sally is the oldest. She's married, has two children of her own. They're at this house today. Thanksgiving Day. They're there. And so is Tom, the, the next in line, the next oldest child. He's there too with his wife. No children yet, but they're both there. They're from out of state, so they don't get together with Sally and mom and dad very often, but the family's especially delighted that Tom and his wife can be there too. Oh, mom's heart is just bursting with joy. You know, moms are like that when they get the family all together, right? <laughs> Dads like it too, but there's just something special about moms. You know, I watch my wife and I just see her glowing at times and all of our kids are together. It's just so wonderful. I love it too, but it just, I think they just take it another level. So mom's heart's just bursting with joy. Dad has the grandkids on his knees, bouncing them up and down, telling stories. The family is gathering for the meal. The table is set beautifully with the finest china and silverware that they own. The smell of the sweet and savory has been wafting through the house all morning. Now the dressing, the fluffy mashed potatoes, the colorful salads and savory entrees, all of them, and the pumpkin pie. It's all on the table. Stomachs are growling. Is yours growling yet? Stomachs are growling. Prayer is offered and the meal begins. The food is delicious. Mom's yeast raised rolls are melting in the mouth. Conversation is delightful. But about halfway through the meal, Dad notices a solemnity and a silence in his wife. Oh, he knows what she's thinking. And that's where his mind goes to. You see, all the family is there except for Joe. Joe's the youngest boy. Joe got mixed up with the wrong crowd at high school, started partying frequently with his buddies. His grades plummeted. His parents sought counsel. They prayed, they reasoned, and they disciplined. But it seemed as if nothing could change the direction of Joe's choices. He graduated, but he didn't go on to college because of his grades. He didn't seem to stay at any job for very long. He struggled with a drinking problem. Joe had become alienated from his parents, and now he blamed them for the problems in his life. Yes, that's what made mom's eyes watery. Mom and dad continued to pray earnestly for Joe every day, but it seemed as if nothing they could do or try to do would make any difference. And furthermore, Joe made it plain. He simply didn't want to talk to them anymore. What a strange blend of emotions, right? On a Thanksgiving day, these parents couldn't be more satisfied with the joy and fulfillment in the success of their two older children and their families, Sally and Tom. What a fulfilling day of fellowship they were enjoying together on Thanksgiving Day. Yet at the same time, their hearts were aching for Joe. Can you not see the heart of our Heavenly Father in the story? 
There is a unique love that God has for every human being. No one is left out of his great plan. And anyone who chooses to be lost, there will be an empty spot in the great heart of love forever because of that decision that God did not plan. No one can fill that spot but that unique person. He has chosen you. He has chosen you and he's chosen me as one of many influences to bring his alienated children back into his family of love. Our church vision statement, which I've not spent much time on yet at all, but I'm going to release it right now, is every member spreading the transformative message of Jesus' unfailing love. Every member. No one, not only is no one left out of his plan to be with him for eternity, no one is left out of his plan to be an instrument in reaching others to join the eternal family. Everyone is called, including you and including me. So my friends, my appeal to you today is this. As you think of God's great heart of love, longing, earnestly longing for his disenfranchised, disenfranchised and alienated family members, his sons and daughters, are you willing to say with me today, here I am, Lord, send me. Here I am, Lord, send me. Again, you may feel incapable inadequate. I do too. The task is beyond me. It's too great. But if we'll do as the lepers chose to do, I'll act on the words of Jesus. We'll find the same results that they found. Restoration, healing, enablement. Amen? Dave? So before I read this, I don't want to forget to make this sad announcement. You know, we have such a long-standing tradition of Dave's Thanksgiving poem. And this is just another nasty interruption of COVID. And so he said, that's not going to take place this year, but we will plan on it next year. So we'll look forward to that. But today we have a poem, and I'm so grateful that you get to share your gift with us another time here, summarizing today's message in this poem. Jesus desires to take us all higher. He calls us to do what he did like clay to the potter, it brings to the Father the joy you can never outbid. So take his example, and not just a sample, in service from heaven above, by giving to others, our sisters and brothers, in unity. That's what love does. Thank you, Dave. Let's pray together. Father, um, what an awesome call you've given us to do what Jesus did. But we're not alone. We acknowledge not possible for us to do this. But we also acknowledge that which is impossible is made possible by you. Jesus, we think of the words where you said, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. And Lord, with you with us, it gives us confidence it gives us peace. It energizes us, stirs us to move forward in faith. Thank you for that promise. And so today, Lord, just hear our response. Weak and trembling though it is, here I am. Send me. In Jesus' name, amen.